Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the Traveler scenario, The Calixcule Incident, written by Martin J. Doherty and released by Mongoose Publishing in 2016. Coming in at just 38 pages, the scenario was playable in a single, albeit good-sized, session. The Travelers don't require having their own starship to do this adventure, but one of them will need the engineering power plant skill. And while the scenario might go a couple different ways in how the Travelers might approach it and overcome their problems, some of their skills that they're probably going to want to have include athletics, uh, seafarer submarine, vac suit, and combat skills. The scenario is modeled after those old disaster movies like the Poseidon Adventure, maybe even Deep Rising, a personal guilty pleasure of my own. The adventure is all planet side, set on the world of Chal... 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 Chalchulitse, some unpronounceable word. It's pronounced Chalchulitque, an Aztec goddess of both water and fertility, which is a really clever name for the planet because it's both a water world and overpopulated. Did you just make that up? Nope, she's got her own Wikipedia page and everything. And look at you throwing stones over hard to pronounce names, Mr. Skorkovsky. Or should I call you Skorkowski, since you can't even pronounce your own name right? Anyway, because that is a mouthful, and some of the spots, such as on the maps, don't have it with an E, while parts of the text have it with an E, for the purpose of this video, we're only going to refer to this as Waterworld. Planet names aside, the first issue with this module is the opening hook. It doesn't make a lot of sense and feels pretty forced, so I made a quick but significant change to it. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, my criticisms and my suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm mostly here to tell jokes and give Seth grief over his bad pronunciations. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, if you ever want to experience this adventure, please stop here. But send your Game Master this way to see about running this module for you. Okay, Game Masters, let's begin the deep dive. That's a pun, because this is an underwater adventure. The first 12 or so pages are just about Waterworld, which is located in the Sindel subsector, which you can find in the Traveler Core book. The short version of all this is, is that the world is almost entirely ocean, and what little land it has is completely packed with people due to a high population and not much room to hold them. Being a Tech Level 7 world, they lack the technology to build underwater cities themselves. However, the previous inhabitants of the planet, prior to the Sindalian Civil War, they were a much higher tech level and they did have underwater cities at that time. So the planetary government has spent a ton of time and money restoring one of those underwater cities the city of Calixcule, which is essentially a huge, kilometer-high building capable of housing two to three million people once it's complete. The biggest hurdle that they have now, though, is to complete the project, they need to get the reactors online. And not being a tech level themselves, in order to build such a reactor, they purchased some old starship power plants that could power the city for decades. However, that reactor is not working at the moment, and no one there has the ability to work on at tech level 12 or however, whatever tech level this generator is, so they have to bring in someone from the outside in order to fix this generator and get that set up right. And that is where the Travelers come in. The adventure begins as the Travelers arrive at the planet. Why they came here doesn't matter. Maybe they're delivering goods, or maybe they're just passing through. We get maps for the planet's modest high port and single downport station. Now one thing that's interesting with the downport and resort is that they're spacious. They're one of the only places on this overcrowded planet where somebody could, you know, stand in one spot and hold their arms out and not touch anyone. Now because of this, jobs there are extremely coveted, and the workers know that they got a pretty good thing going here, so they're all super afraid of losing their jobs. So in addition to the module saying that they're forbidden to reveal to outsiders exactly how bad the conditions are on this planet, I also made them extremely friendly and enthusiastic to help because they were terrified that somebody might complain about them and they might lose their job. This led to one overly paranoid player to deduce that the Disneyland-esque friendliness could only mean, there is something seriously wrong with the people here, guys. I mean, they are too damn friendly. You ask me? I think they are torturing all the people on this planet. I am sure that this adventure is going to be about us liberating this planet from its oppressors. 
I can't even say that that's the character, because the player does this all the time, no matter what character they have or what system they're playing. Anyway, instead of hiding the truth about the world's overpopulation and the lack of living space and hoping that the player characters just somehow figure this out, I say you just go ahead and make this more obvious. First, if the travelers are from the Sindel subsector or they've spent any significant amount of time here, I'd go ahead and let them make an education roll to see if maybe they've heard about this or rumors about this so they know that already going in. Maybe as the travelers are coming in to land, right, they can see the starport and star town and it's generously spaced out and it's all pretty. But behind it, you know, on the slopes of the other islands that are around this one, they can see these just masses of buildings that are all huddled together and filling every centimeter of square space, you know, even leaning precariously out over the water in some sort of haphazard fashion like the walled city of China. Anyway, shortly after they arrive, they're approached by a government official who explains to them that the generators at the Calixcule project need repair, and they offer the travelers some money to go look at these generators and possibly fix them. So you guys are going to trust a project that cost billions of credits, years of work, and potentially the lives of millions of people to a group of random space truckers that you found at the dock? I guess that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. This project is the largest project of this type in the world, and they're just offering critical jobs to some randos that they found on the street. Imagine, if you will, the Hoover Dam. In the middle of building it, you realize that you need a plumber. So you go to the local hardware store and find a guy in the plumbing aisle, and you're all, hey, you. And he's all, me? And you're all, yeah, do you know plumbing? And he says, well, I replaced a faucet once. And you say, perfect, you are more than qualified for the job. You want 50 grand to do the plumbing for our multi-million dollar dam? And he's all, really? And you're all, really? And he's all, hell yeah, I'm your guy. Let's do this. That's how this comes off. So instead of doing it that way, let me offer you two other options of ways that a game master could approach this. First, you can have a reason that the government needs to have this done right now and they don't have time to wait. Such as the new generators are broken down and the backups keep, uh, can't keep sustaining all this for more than just a couple more weeks. Otherwise, the city might reflood and thousands of workers have to be evacuated and millions upon millions of credits are lost, as well as a lot of time. So time is extremely important that they have to get those generators back online now. And the engineering team that was actually supposed to come to the planet in order to do this repair, they were on their way, but something bad has happened to them. Like their ship crashed in the middle of landing. And maybe the travelers saw their ship crash. Maybe the travelers tried to help this ship that was giving out distress calls. You know, mayday, mayday, somebody help us. You know, we've, you know we're in trouble. And then they see the ship crash and they know that everyone on board has already died. So this engineering team that was supposed to come and fix these generators is dead. The government has zero options at this point. The lives of thousands of people are at risk. Uh, there's no time in order for them to send for a new team that can come and do this job for them. So when the travelers show up at the starport, they're like, hey, you guys, you need to help us. That gives not just a sense of urgency to this job, but a reason why the government would trust this important job to a bunch of random strangers. Option two is that the travelers were specifically sent to the planet to do this job, which is the way I ran it when we did this adventure. Uh, the traveler's patron was a crime lord on the planet Thief, and he fancied himself to be a businessman, and like many mob businessmen, his business was construction. So he was the one that sold the old starship power plant to the city in the first place. You know, he had it sent there. So one day he pulls the travelers into his office and he asks them if anyone knows how to work on a reactor. Oh yeah, boss, I got power plant engineering at first level. You know, not great by any stretch of the imagination, but it's good enough for our dinky little starship. Why do you ask? So their mob boss patron told them that they're supposed to go to Waterworld and fix this reactor, maybe install some new software or something like that. It's nothing too difficult, but he wants to keep his clients happy because they're going to be doing more business with him in the future. But also, while they're in the city, there's a little bit of a side job that he wants them to do. Now we'll get to what that side job is in a little bit and why I added it, but the travelers arrived at the planet specifically to do the job, and they knew that they weren't super experts in working on power plants, but everyone on this planet thought they were, and I found this to be a whole lot better. Once they take the job, they're loaded onto a submarine and travel from the starport to the underwater city. Unless your players are just really into role-playing with the crew, you can breeze through this one pretty quickly if you like and get down to the adventure. 
The big things that they need to learn while they're doing this voyage is that the submarine has a maximum safety depth of about 950 meters, and below that it could get crushed. And as they approach the city, they should hear the sound of squid bang torpedoes going off, and the captain can explain to them that there's these giant squids that live near there, and they occasionally mess with the city, but they're easily chased off with these loud torpedoes. Now one thing that the module isn't really clear on is where the submarine docks. The city has two docks on the map. The top, which is far above the inhabited zone, connected by a long stairwell, and the deep sea work docks. But the module specifically states that the sub descends to 600 meters to a main dock, which I would put here. I found this bit to be confusing, so I just said that yes, there is a midpoint dock a few floors above the secondary reactors. The travelers are going to arrive to much fanfare. The city administrator gives them a tour of the facility, throws a dinner for them, and tells them that tomorrow he's going to send them down in a deep sea submarine to the bottom of the city so they can fix that reactor. The big thing that you need to pass to the travelers during all this is let them see the crappy secondary reactors that are currently doing the job of the primary and they don't have much more time on them, and also tell them that the partially flooded midsection floors, they've had problems with people sneaking down there and trying to scavenge or loot that area. Now one thing I would also go ahead and add is some marine biologist when they go to the dinner, and that marine biologist states how the pea squids are getting more bold, and they believe that the rise of pea squid attacks is due to increased activity around the city, and it's scaring away too much of their food supply, and one day these squids are going to attack. The reason being, of course, is that any good disaster movie should always include that one expert who states exactly what's about to happen, and no one listens to them. Anyway, that night, a group of giant squids attacks an incoming submarine called the Nilla. The damaged sub collides with the city before crashing to the ocean floor. The impact causes flooding, which begins shorting out the secondary reactor, lights are going out, emergency hatches are shutting, alarms are blaring, and the city is in peril of being lost unless power can be activated to get those pumps back online. Meanwhile, the surviving crew of the Nilla is at the bottom of the ocean with these squids trying to get inside, and the big threat of the ship just imploding because it's under 1100 meters of water. Wow, well this place is lost. I guess we should just evacuate the city and call it a day. The travelers, of course, could try to evacuate along with everybody else. However, the number of people here and the amount of damage and the fact that they're completely out in the middle of nowhere, so far away from any other cities or anywhere else that they could go, means that it would be impossible for everybody to safely escape and hundreds are going to die, even if the travelers themselves manage to survive. The city manager is also wanting to rescue the crew of the Nilla, and he begs the travelers for help that they head down and turn on the main reactors. Now, this is where in my game the secondary objective came in. First, the travelers needed the city to survive because their patron was doing business with the planet, and they didn't want the patron to lose their customer, otherwise it might turn their patron into an enemy. Second, and the reason that he really sent them there, was because there was a crewman that was aboard the Nilla, and they were supposed to hand off some information to the travelers that they were supposed to bring back to their boss. Which means, not only do the travelers have a reason that they need to save the city, but they have a reason to go down and rescue the sunken crew aboard the Nilla. Because the main dock is damaged, and the crowds are now racing up that one stairwell to get to the top dock, and they've completely filled the stairway, the only real way down is for the travelers to descend through the partially flooded floors, about 300 meters of them, to get to the work zone where mini subs and deep diving suits can get them down the rest of the way. It was at this point that one of my players had a pretty good idea. Okay, we'll navigate through that maze work of flooded and half broken floors just to get down below. But you had said earlier that you guys are having a lot of trouble with Ludas, so do you happen to capture any of those Ludas? Because we could use them as a guide to help navigate our way through that mess a whole lot faster. I thought it was a pretty brilliant idea, so I said sure. So the travelers freed a recently captured scavenger who gladly helped them out because her life was also in danger in case the city flooded. Crossing the half-flooded floors is or should be the main part of the adventure, and this is really where the action finally begins. However, the module sort of breezes through this part. We get no maps or floor plan of this place, and the reason that's given is that there are hundreds of floors and it would be a waste to map all of them. But I would have really found a basic, you know, cross-section map to be really useful. Down there are several bands of scavengers who might not have any idea about the accident and may try to defend themselves from the travelers, you know, thinking them as being police or as being rivals. 
I suggest that you have a few bands down there. Uh, maybe the first one attacks them, and the other one is willing to talk to the travelers, or the travelers are willing to talk to them. And maybe a third one is actually calling out for help, because you know, a wall or a floor or something has collapsed, and it's trapped some of them, and the water is rising. So now the travelers might have to rescue these scavengers. I also had their guide point out certain stuff, like directions and signs and marks that the scavengers had painted on the walls, you know, and told the travelers how to read those marks, you know, that way it could get them down faster through the first several floors at least. For this whole part, it's going to be pretty freeform in how you run this, so I suggest that you come up with several obstacles that the travelers can encounter and possible skills that they need to overcome them, or more precisely, obstacle choices. Such as, they might try to muscle or leverage their way through a stuck-in door. Or if they can't do that, then they can find a small, jagged little hole that they have to use their dexterity skills in order to slither through. Or you could have a spot where they have to climb down some rusty cables through an elevator shaft to get a few floors lower. But if they can't do that, then there's also a stairwell and they might have to leap over a lot of broken steps in order to get that same distance lower. I'd hesitate to put any obstacle that you put in their way be the only way to cross it. I'd recommend that you give at least two different options as ways that things can overcome something and keep getting lower. You know, mix it up. That way it's not always the same skill that they need in order to overcome an obstacle, such as an athletics role or something like that. Try to get a diversity as far as what skills might be useful. That way multiple players can be involved. The whole time you need to be keeping the mood during this as the water is getting higher and higher and the floors are letting out underneath the weight and more water comes crashing down, uh, where the building is shuddering and groaning with various bulkheads giving out both above and below them. After facing a young giant squid that somehow got in here, the travelers are going to make it to the work zone. Here they get their options as ways that they can get lower, either facing off against the squids that are attacking the sunken submarine, or navigating their way through a debris field in order to get inside the city's reactor. This section arguably has one of the best module chapters of all time, and the player characters have a lot that they can do here. Some can fabricate bombs by joining up squid bank charges into some actual charges that could hurt these things. Or they can affix, you know, cut girders or pipes to the sides of these robotic submarines, kind of like lances or spears, and they can kind of drive these things down and, you know, spear giant squids or try to attach bombs to them. Maybe with these squids, you should give them some more alien features, you know, such as, you know, bioluminescence, and they shoot clouds of glowing ink once they feel threatened. Or maybe, you know, each tentacle has a little mouth on the end of it. For getting inside the reactor's chamber, again, I really wish there was a map for this, so I made a very simple one. It gives us two possible entrances that they can take. The first requires navigating a debris field from a smashed crane and some other junk, and the other is right up against the sunken Nilo, which is currently being swarmed by giant squids. Once inside, they only need to make some basic rolls to get this reactor online. However, a damaged robo-diver has managed to get inside here as well, and is just smashing things up. This thing ended up being one of the toughest opponents in the scenario. First, the travelers might not have that many weapons or enough weapons that could try to penetrate this thing's armor. And also, for our group, half the party was outside, you know, using robo subs and different bombs, and they were fighting giant squids. Well, they just sent a couple people down into the reactor to get this thing going, so they were kind of undermanned when they came across this. Because this robo diver is said to be heavily damaged, Game Masters might want to drop its armor or its hit points, you know, maybe give it a couple critical hits to reflect that damage. I also had it where if one of the travelers could manage to get on top of this thing, they could make a remote operations check and essentially you know, find the switch and turn this thing off. And this led to a really interesting fight as, you know, characters are climbing up scaffolding and machinery and trying to leap down on top of this thing like it was bucking around like some sort of robotic bull. Once the reactors are online and the nil has either been rescued or destroyed, the adventure is done. If they save the day, the travelers are big damn heroes. Not just for the people in the city, but for the whole world whose future is riding on the ClickSchool project's success. Overall, I found the adventure to be simply okay. I love the concept of it, the disaster movie feel that it gives, uh, the threat of water and the change of scenery from our more conventional sci-fi scenarios. I really do love that. But the execution underwhelms me. The awkward opening hook to it all, the fact that the module repeatedly tries to hide the population problem, but then expects the players to make decisions all about it as if they knew about this population problem, uh, the lack of cross-section maps for the city, which once again I would have found really helpful, the very long 
lead up to where the adventure actually begins, but then at that point it suddenly feels rushed, you know, not giving the game masters really enough to work with here. I feel like the adventure spent so much time on their background and setup rather on the adventure itself. I want the monsters to feel more alien, you know? Aside from being colossal, the giant squids are pretty normal, and I like to have them some feature or something about them that makes them feel weird. Finally, and this is a criticism I've had for a lot of the different travel material that's out there now, is the art. The module has a good deal of art, and it's from obviously talented artists. I have no complaints with either the quality or the quantity of the art that Mongoose is giving us, but the art itself doesn't inspire me. Such as, we have this group of scavengers, this squid, this submarine, but none of them are moving. There's no scene that's depicted here. Why not have a squid attacking the submarine? Or a group of scavengers that are in waist-deep water, you know, firing on a group of travelers who are currently trying to, you know, climb down some rusty elevator cables uh, while there's a flooded area beneath and there's a squid reaching up from below. Give me a scene. Give me a story in the art. We've got pictures of equipment, gear, which that's great. I do need to know what those look like, but they're never doing anything. I want to see some of those things, you know, battling squid or navigating the debris field trying to get inside to where the reactor is. Instead, we've got images of gauges and computers, random tanks, signs, and even this dog, which doesn't even appear in the scenario. Total random dog. I've always said that I'm a huge sucker for good art in tabletop games, but what makes that art good isn't just the quality or the quantity of the art, but that the fact that the art inspires me. And aside from the cover image that does tell us a story, the art, like much of the adventure itself, feels underwhelming when compared to what its potential was. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, you forgot to mention the part where if you want this to really be like a disaster movie, then all of the NPCs need to either be up-and-coming stars that haven't had their big break yet, or played by big-name celebrity actors that are about 20 years past their prime. That's how you know you got a good disaster movie.